So my first question um, is just kind of an easy, like, basic, why did you write The Nature Fixed? Because, you know, starting off, it's a fabulous book, by the way. I absolutely loved it. You know, very engaging and um, reading it, of course, I'm like, I just want to be out in the trees and have yeah. nature. But I'm curious, you know, why exactly did you write a book like The Nature Fix? I was really motivated by my own um, curiosity and my own personal story. So I have always been someone who is very connected uh, to the natural world and to nature settings. I was really fortunate to be able to spend 23 years living in Colorado and Montana, where I had you know, sort of daily access um, to just fantastic quality, you know, nature, trails and mountains. And then my family moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, for a job. And so uh, I just personally felt um, very affected by that move. I felt like kind of a stress bomb, you know, went off in my own brain. <laughs> it made me more anxious. I got depressed. Um, I, I had some brain fog. I had trouble sleeping. I would just like burst into tears driving around the traffic circles Ooh. in Washington, D.C. And I started to really wonder, you know, what the science had to say about um, what I was experiencing. You know, uh, the journalist Richard Louvre had coined the term nature deficit disorder in 2006. And I, I just wondered what, you know, what, was that a real thing? It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a term that's been accepted by the medical community, but <laughs> that what I was experiencing? Um, was, it, was this a result of deprivation from nature? Uh, and, you know, I, I was amazed, actually, to, to find out that there was so much science that had taken place since 2006. I was really fortunate to get an assignment from Outside Magazine and then from National Geographic, you know, to really go around the world, um, talk to the scientists who were really at the forefront of this, uh, and learn, you know, learn what they were finding out about the neuroscience, about the psychology, um, about the sort of evolutionary anthropology, you know, what was happening to our brains when we live in a city. And so that's that's really what motivated it. That's awesome. And and just like such a personal motivation and you can see that throughout the book, which I really appreciated. Um, of course, you know, for people who haven't read the book, it's based off of studies that you're, you know, in like both participating in, but also, you know, interviewing the researchers of and talking about what they're doing. I'm curious how long it took you to write the book because you go all around the world and you, you know, participate in all sorts of studies. Um, you know, what, what was that like doing the research and, and how long did it take to write this book? Uh, the research was really fascinating uh, because I had these magazine assignments. You know, again, I was very, very fortunate to be able to travel, um, you know, for the book. I, I think National Geographic maybe sent me to like five or six countries, you know, wow. paid my way. Um, Outside Magazine sent me to Japan. Um, it, it was just really very lucky and fascinating because the way that the Asian scientists approached these questions, you know, compared to the Scandinavian scientists, compared to the American scientists, everyone was kind of looking at it in slightly different, through a slightly different lens. Uh, and, you know, these were, these were really fun fun places to go because I would go to nature. <laughs> That's where the science was taking place. So in Japan, I you know was hiking on the forest therapy trails where scientists were able to measure my cortisol and my heart rate variability, um, you know, kind of in different settings. Um, when I was in Scandinavia, I visited some um, horticulture therapy programs, you know, which were just delightful and beautiful, you know, these extensive gardens um, where there are amazing treatment programs for people suffering from depression or from PTSD, um, even from Alzheimer's. Uh, there, there's uh, some really intriguing science about how being in a garden, for example, can reduce uh, an Alzheimer patient's need for um, medication. Wow. Uh, especially for sort of anti-anxiety medication. And also how, how um, opening up all of your senses, which you're able to do outside, you, know, you smell things, you hear things, you taste things. Some of these patients are growing plants, they're doing nature art. Um, you know, this sort of multi-sensorial approach to therapy is incredibly effective for, um, for example, for um, stroke patients, right, who are trying to sort of relearn language. Um, it's very helpful for people with trauma, um, you know, who want to sort of reconnect 
to their senses and to their bodies. So, and, and then of course I was able, uh, speaking of PTSD, I was able to go on a, a couple of wilderness rafting trips in the United States. Uh, I did one in Utah and one in Idaho where uh, I, you know, I was able to kind of um, hang out with these veterans who would come back from the theater of war. Uh, as I, I went out with a group of women veterans. It was, it was really moving, you know, and powerful to sort of watch the transformation um, in these women after being outside for five days, sleeping under the stars, um, you know, kind of able to feel the relaxation and comfort that being in a quiet, natural environment can provide. That's amazing. And I'm going to ask you, of course, a very difficult question, which is, do you have a particular favorite study that you interviewed um, or participated in around the world? Or were they all kind of your favorites? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a hard one. My favorite study. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of dazzled, like a lot of people, by brain science and by the brain imaging studies. I mean, they, they seem, um, you know, intriguing, right? I think they, they just really capture a moment in time and it's a little bit controversial, you know, sort of how, how much they, you know, can really tell us. But um, I, I was really interested by a study out of Stanford where a psychologist sent a group of people to walk for 90 minutes um, around a city park, pretty city park. It's in Palo Alto, it's, Palo, it's, the, um, it's the Stanford dish, you know, mm. it's a very pretty park. And then a, another group to walk around um, downtown Palo Alto, El Camino Real. And he imaged their brains before and after. He was looking at one part of the brain called the subgenual prefrontal cortex, uh, which uh, has been sort of, I guess, shown to be linked to ruminative thinking. So sort of, you know, a lot of repetitive negative thoughts. Uh, and those are in turn linked to depression. So, uh, of course, depression is a you know, major issue uh, mm -hmm. in the United States, in the industrial world, uh, more so now, you know, particularly. Yeah, so anything we can do, right, to help prevent depression or treat it is really important. So, so that's why he wanted to look at that part of the brain. And, um, it, and he also gave these subjects questionnaires. So what he found was really interesting, which is that in the city walkers, the before and after brain imaging didn't really change. Um, and in fact, they came back and they were still sort of, you know, grumpy and, and still having their, you know, kind of same negative thoughts maybe that they were ha mm -hmm. having at the beginning. But in the nature walkers, he actually saw this reduction in, in activation. So reduction in blood flow and that particular sort of rumination box or the worry box in your brain. Sure. And in fact, those, those participants said, you know what, by the end of my walk, I really wasn't thinking about those negative thoughts anymore. And I, that just, that study really spoke to me because it speaks to my personal experience, you know, where if I go out, I'm in a much better mood, you know, after um, I have more perspective on my problems, maybe I haven't even thought about my problems as much, you know, um, I'm, I'm able to kind of get in a more um, zone of sensory experience, you know, where I'm listening for the birds and I'm, you know, maybe hearing the water and feeling the sun. And it, you know, I think we've all had this experience, right? Where we are just so much happier when we come back than when we left. Sure, absolutely. No, I thought that study was really compelling as well, reading it in your book, and just it made me want to go back out and, and just walk around and try to work on my own stress. Good, so, good. yeah, absolutely. Do you think, in writing your book and after getting it published, I'm, I'm just thinking, did you expect people to change how they viewed nature after they read your book? Did you expect that sort of impact? Uh, that, sure, yes. That was absolutely a goal. Um, and I think that that's one thing that may be helpful by writing in the first person. Sure. You know, by sort of conveying my own experience. You know, hey, I learned a lot about how to really appreciate nature more in a city, for example. Um, I learned how to sort of find moments of beauty, how to cultivate awe how to be present and mindful in a nature space in a way that kind of maximizes those benefits. I absolutely hope that that information will be helpful to people because, you know, we are all struggling right now and, and we all struggle with lives that are sort of over-programmed, that are too busy, that are stressful, um, you know, and, and some stress is good, right? It motivates us when we meet our deadlines, we get a lot of, we get a lot done. Um, but we are not so good at recovering from the stress. 
And in fact, if we can learn how to do that, right, it just will make us better people. It makes us more fun to be around. It makes us better, you know, partners and parents, better friends. Um, so it's absolutely um, a hope of mine that, you know, people can experience the sort of um, it, it, almost therapeutic, right, almost medication effects <laughs> of, of time and nature. Just a follow-up question to that is, do you, have you already seen kind of how people have changed their viewpoints after reading your book, maybe even just more anecdotally if friends have read it and said, you know, oh, this changed me or, or something like that. Oh, yes. I, I have to tell you, I mean, uh, every week I get emails from people who will tell me, you know, I read your book and it changed me. It has changed my life. I now, um, you know, go to nature. I feel better. I, you know, I, maybe it's for people who um, I, I got a very moving email from someone with cancer, a young man with cancer. Um, he started going to um, a shoreline uh, on a lake near his house and um, dancing with the birds, dancing with the cranes on this lake. And he sent me a video of himself Aww. dancing with cranes. You know, and I just, I just started um, crying. I mean, it was really beautiful. More than ever, it's become really important to find the things that do give us joy and can help us sleep and can help us calm down and can help us maybe prevent you know some of the despair um and hopelessness you know that is so pervasive right now um i think this you know one of the silver linings to this pandemic you know if, if it's possible to find any um are that i think we are we are appreciating um more you know what what we have nearby and and that includes the people and it also includes the natural world. And it also includes our pets, right? Look at how many <laughs> people are, are finding so much comfort and joy in their animals, which I will just point out is a form of nature connection, right? This is a kind of an interspecies bond um, that is certainly a kind of nature fix. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think people see it that way, but that is a good good way to do it is, you know, you have nature in your house with your pet. You do. You do. And, and in fact, you know, people are, they're bringing in more house plants. Yes. They're setting up window boxes where they're growing things. I mean, I've certainly started doing that a lot this summer. Um, you know, just, just these little things that we're able to just kind of do with our hands. Um, or, you know, I think we've forgotten. We've forgotten how joyful and gratifying uh, these kinds of hobbies can be. Yeah, absolutely. It is kind of nice to have that in a weird sort of way, forceful return <laughs> to, to things like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, sort of just basic, um, basic human, uh, human activities, like even cooking, you know, mm. I think people are, are kind of, not everyone, but I think some people are finding a lot of joy um, in, in cooking now that, that we had sort of been so happy to outsource, you know, in our very, very, you know, busy, over-programmed, over-traveled lives. Absolutely. So let me ask you, if I can ask you, what are you currently working on? I know you have a podcast and I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about that, but could you also just tell me what, what you're currently up to and if you have a next book on the horizon or not or something like that? Yeah, thanks. I've actually, I've made three podcasts. They've all been, um, you know, sort of a limited run. So one was a six episode podcast, two or eight episode podcast. So I don't have one I'm currently, um, you know, putting out, but I've had three that I've done in the past. And um, it was really, really fun to kind of switch mediums and, uh, you know, do something more sort of audio based. That was also kind of a collaborative effort too, in a way I'm not used to. I mean, I was working with a sound engineer and a producer and executive producer and um, anyway, that was really just a, a fun and joyful process and another way, I think, to tell stories, you know, that might reach a different audience. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm currently working on my third book. Um, not ready to talk too much about it, but of it's course. also a science-based book um, based on some personal experience. And um, I would love to talk to you about it when it comes out. So. <laughs> Good. I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. And it's totally fine. I don't, I don't need to know more. <laughs> I'll, I'll like the, suspri the surprise. <laughs> I definitely will have the link up to your podcasts. Are they all um, on Spotify or Google Podcasts? Where can people find them? Yeah, two, two of them are, I think, really re readily available on iTunes and elsewhere. And then one of them is still under a paywall at, on Audible. Okay. Um, so it was commissioned by Audible, and that's where it's available. And I, I think they're actually, I call it a podcast, but they call it an audio book. So ah. um, it's behind a small paywall. Okay, perfect. <laughs> oh, worth it. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, good. I will put those up so people can listen to them. Thank you so, so much for letting me interview you. I've really no, had a fun no, time. Thank you so much for reaching out. It's really been a pleasure.